you're listening to Death of the Reader. Flex and Herds here for your Murder Mystery World Tour. And we are here once again with Trent's Last Case by E.C. Bentley, chapters 6 to 11, telling the story of how Philip Trent chose never to be a detective again. Or did he choose? Maybe he died. What? We don't know, because this is the middle section, and Hertz is charged with solving it. I'm excited. Especially since apparently we're being given the solution to the crime, maybe, by the end of this section of the book. Ooh. It's crazy. But I looked at May Reader, we're like 55% of the way in. Look. There's there's shenanigans afoot and it it's it's there insane. I'm worried about it. Afoot. It's gonna be great. Yeah, we start this stretch of chapters introducing uh, Bunner, who is the right hand man of the, the dead Sigsby Manderson. He has a bit of insight on the case. We talk a little bit about Huckleberry Finn. Mm. We meet the French maid Celestine, who bemoans in untranslated French that Sigsby Manderson never paid her any attention. Sure. And then we go on to meet Mrs. Manderson, uh, Mabel, who is the niece of one of Trent's good friends, mm. Burton Couples. They reminisce on the, the the tragic burden that poor Mrs. Manderson has been presented with. Talk again about Huckleberry Finn. Maybe I'm mixing up chapters. Maybe they only talk about Huckleberry Finn are. once. I'm pretty sure Bunner only talks about to show how how old he is. Although I don't know if it would... Or, or, <laughs> you know what? I'm not sure what yeah, Huckleberry Finn was written compared to this novel, but I assume that's the, the general intent. Yeah. It's a time up in politics and also to have that lovely quote about how someone's off doing something that takes several days that could have been done in 20 minutes. And it's just ridiculous that anyone would go to that that length of, of effort. It is it is good fun though how many like references to other books that feel so ancient to us mm. uh, there are in this you know we hear about the case of Mary Mary Celia Rogers as though it's recent news which in a manner of speaking it kind of was yeah uh, when this when this book came out uh, the other thing that feels surprisingly recent is that chapter eight the inquest oh my goodness feels yes. exactly like the scene from Whose Body. I was going to say, it it does. Also, I'm really quite happy that since our first encounter with, with a coroner's inquest, um, we've had we've had two more in the same year. I don't, I don't know that we've ever had a coroner's inquest in the show before this year, and now we've had three. It's quite ridiculous. It is pretty strange, yeah. yeah but it, it's very obvious the further we get into this novel how directly Dorothy L. Sayers ripped Whose Body from this book. Like... In Whose Body, we spend a lot of time looking at the corpse and what it was wearing as a manner mm -hmm. of clues in the same way that in chapter four and five in this book, we spent a lot of uh, time looking at the way that Sigsby Manderson was dressed as yep. we were looking at last week. And I don't think, you know, we, we've done the murder mystery world tour for a number of years at this point and traced influences from author to author many a time, but I don't think I've ever seen anything as... Uh, wholesale mm. as the theft that Dorothy L. Sayers has committed here. It's pretty ridiculous. It's it's to the point that when I'm when I'm looking at like solving the novel, I'm thinking, would they would, would they really use the same solution twice? Is that where we're going with this? Is mm. that is that what's happening? But we don't know. But then of course there's something that I I don't think I have the mental fortitude to decipher herds. And I was hoping uh -oh. you you could sure. help me here, Herds, in that Correct me if I'm wrong. Is Philip Trent falling for Mrs. Mabel Manderson? Uh, oh, my goodness. I mean, he's clearly got, like, a protective streak on her. It seems like he presents the truth to her, but says, you know, I want your permission to tell the truth to the world. Yes. Um, it's, it's very much a case of him not wanting to hurt her any more than she's already been hurt, empathizing with the situation, all that sort of fun stuff that we love to see in our Golden Age Detective uh, fiction. We we also have this really weird couple of moments with Mabel. One of which is as they're leaving the coroner's inquest. Uh, Mabel, having testified, is like getting lightheaded and struggling, mm. and she like reaches for Philip Trent to escort her out of the court. And I, I couldn't quite decipher the atmosphere that E.C. Bentley was going for, but it definitely felt like E.C. Bentley was trying to leave some romantic breadcrumbs along that uh, that Look, runway out of the court. Clearly, clearly, Ms. Manison knows who's gonna who's gonna solve this mystery. She's gotta she's gotta put her cards where they lay, as it were. She's gotta get in good with the hero. That's how it works. 
I mean, I guess it does and it doesn't work because soon after that we have the showdown kind of moment mm. where Trent asks, Mrs. Manderson, will you assure me that your husband's change yes. toward you had nothing to do with John Marlowe and what he dreaded came? Oh, she cried with a sound of anguish. Like, he doesn't ask her, was your husband mm. jealous? He almost frames it as if he is presupposing her guilt in having an affair with John Marlowe. Sure. And he is equally as hurt by her response because he, as I said, almost feels like he's falling for her. Yeah, it's pretty bizarre, isn't it? And I I do love how, even though this novel is is supposing that Marlowe is is the killer, as far as I can tell, we're not going to interrogate the culprit. Not only do we go to a person who couldn't possibly have killed their husband, but (laughs) well, but uh, it's not to ascertain, you know, a a speech. It's only communicated in that one word that like exasperated the tragic cry, you know? Yeah. It's quite, uh, quite elegant, I guess. There is something both elegant, but also at times disappointingly blunt Mm. about the way that EC Bentley does like atmosphere in this book. I remember there was an example in uh, last week's stretch of chapters where Trent is like reflecting uh, on on the horror of a scene and there's this moment where he's like, ah, there was this grim frozen atmosphere, but then Trent focused and ignored the grim frozen atmosphere. <laughs> we ain't got no time for that. And- <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's almost as Spartan as Sigsby Manderson's furnishings in his estate. The focus, and this is something that that we, we talked about last week a lot. What are the raw mechanics of the mystery, but also what are the character motivations? Mm. What are we saying about like love and determination and the relationships we have with our, with our spouses? You know, that's, that's all the stuff that, that really is going to matter for resolving this mystery um, is all the, all that good chunky motive stuff. Right. That said, like, despite how good the balance is in this story between the narrative and the clues side of things, there definitely are still a few bits where I, I just kind of caught myself napping as he's listing like the times I, look. that uh, <laughs> Marlo went out to catch a boat to meet George I was Harris coming say, from Paris. I assume that this story is characterized as the first golden age mystery because of all its blasted train puzzles which I will not be attempting to solve, at least not in a more complicated way than this is probably the, the barest, simplest answer I can give, you know, because I am so done with train and boat and car puzzles. I mean, you've been done with them since day zero. I like, have, and I'm still done with them. There was never any start on them. So- I think the thing that EC Bentley does a good job of in here, though, is it feels like he makes it clear that narratively the clues there serve a purpose sure even if you don't want to engage with the mechanics yeah sure i mean there's that definitive point on the end of he was not there at this time you know the i mean the book outright says in the the unpublished what what is it called the the chapter 11 the issue is that he has an alibi but perhaps we could break it with these points and he has like a list of five five points in favor and it's it's ridiculous but it is clear. It is clear enough if you're willing to put in the time to think about the mystery. I have I have one final question for you on the characterization of Sixby Manderson. I'm worried. Yep. I understand that you're a, a young whippersnapper who uses the internet herds. Am I? Oh, goodness. Yes. Would you describe Sixby Manderson as someone with a Sigma male grussel? Yes, I would. I would 100%. Sigma male to the T. Okay. <laughs> That's terrible. Why would you ask me this? <laughs> I was I was describing I was describing Six V Anderson to someone while I was reading the book here at, to SER, and they said, "Oh, sounds like a real Sigma Grussler." And oh I was like, goodness. "What did you just say to me?" I should not familiar with the term <laughs> Grussler, but that, that sounds it's it's grind set and hustle glued together. Oh, uh, there you go. I I See, had to look that one. Up. I just look it up. And I get Christian <laughs> Grussler, who is a professor of mechanical engineering. <laughs> Shout out to Christian Grussler. <laughs> On Google Scholar, um, <laughs> oh, that's terrible! Wow, there's a lot of that's terrible. there's a lot of of results for Christian Grussler. Apparently, they're very well respected. Okay, uh, apparently anyway. so. <laughs> anyway, we should wrap this here. You're listening to Death Good. of the Reader, your murder mystery world tour. We are discussing EC Bentley's Trent's last case, chapters six to eleven. Stick around, more to come. You're on to SER one hundred seven point three.
you're listening to Death of the Reader, Flex here, out in Australia since August and hitting US shelves this November and regular paperback coming out in January. It's all getting a bit above my head. The Innocent One is Lisa Valentine's latest thriller, taking us back to the world of Daniel Hunter and Sebastian Kroll, solicitor and client, respectively, of the infamous Angel Murder wherein an 11-year-old Seb was accused of killing his friend Ben. A decade later, Sebastian calls Daniel, concerned he might land in the spotlight over the murder of a university lecturer and all the wounds that that could reopen. Lisa, welcome to the show. It's wonderful to have you here on Death of the Reader. Thank you so much for having me. I'm delighted to um, be on your show. First of all, congratulations on a year of this book coming out through Augusts and Novembers and Aprils, I think, was the earliest one that I saw. (laughs) Yeah, no, it's been a long journey, but it's it's really exciting um, to have the book um, just come out in the US a couple of days ago. So um, just sort of riding on that wave of, you know, getting a nice New York Times review and and really happy. And um, yeah, just looking forward to see what else, um, what else, what other good things can happen. Yeah, I guess the thing that I wanted to start with is that it's 10 years on in the fiction from when this case happened. It's almost 10 years on. Uh, in the real world, though I suppose it's probably longer for you, what with the, the world of drafting and uh, and editing. Why revisit Daniel Hunter now, 10 years on? The Guilty One was my my debut novel. So it wasn't the, the first novel that I wrote. Like many writers, you know, you've, you've always got like that bottom drawer that's jammed full of other novels. But it was certainly the first novel that I had published. And it was very well received. And I always had a, a special relationship with the characters in that book. And whenever I did events, whether it was for the guilty one or my future novels, they would always ask what about what what happened. You know, the, it's almost like the guilty one, the conclusion of it didn't satisfy people. To begin with, I always said that I felt their story was closed. The sort of narrative arc for me was fully satisfied um, with the, the sort of resolution of that nature nurture thing that was going through the novel. But as time went on, and you're exactly right, it was 10 years, you know, when I was writing it to when um, the story had first come out. And I thought it is actually quite interesting as a proposition to write it now. Maybe not, you know, six, seven years ago when perhaps not much would have happened. But in the first novel, Sebastian, who was on trial for killing another child, was just 11 years old. But now he is a young man, but he's a fully grown adult. And what implications does that have? What has he become? Are our childhood sins always going to be following us into the future? And likewise with the the lawyer character, Daniel, um, he had suffered quite a lot in his childhood. So that I knew that his adult relationships were going to continue to be difficult for him and that he would struggle there. So I guess that was why I thought now was a good time to revisit the story. There's so many things that you kind of give away in the setup of this novel. The case in The Guilty One and the case in The Innocent One have so many obvious parallels that you can like see why Sebastian is concerned and why he's come back to Daniel. But that also raises questions for you of, okay, but the similarities there are getting a little silly. Like, did he do this? And I thought that it's like, it's so interesting structurally giving so much away as a method to explore the characters sort of in that very tartan noir style um like you know william mcelvani giving away the entire plot of his mystery so that he could tell a loving story about glasgow like what about that style appeals to you in terms of putting so many cards on the table at the start of a novel? Yeah, I mean, oh, thank you so much for that that lovely comparison because I, I loved William McIlvenny. Um, You know, I met him um, shortly before he passed away. I met him at Bloody Scotland, which is one of the literary festivals we have there. He's a very generous, generous man and and a great genius. And I, and I think also, you know, obviously he was crowned the sort of um, father of tartan noir, but he's so much more than that. He's a he's a genius of a writer. I think. Yeah, I was I was lucky to 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 speak with him. But um, on the subject of giving a lot away, um, I think I think it's because I think my motivation for writing, even though a lot of my stories are mysteries, my motivation for writing is is not really the who done it, but the, the why. You know, so I'm I'm very much interested in. in 
shining a light on dark corners and trying to explore the reasons why people do something much more than than you know who who is the murderer yeah i, I was going to say cuz one of the really fascinating things is like about the character selection that you have through the innocent ones is how much everyone is a more extreme version of one another you know like daniel and sebastian bond over this like similarity that they have in their childhoods of this trauma and the relationship with their mother and the way that their parents passed away and as the book goes on it kind of becomes apparent that this is like a structural thing for everyone in the story which is like so interesting because of how diverse the cast feels but when you like lay out the facts you're like wow Everyone here is the same, and I thought that was so clever. Yeah, I'm, I'm not sure if they're all the same, but I suppose they're all I suppose they're all dealing with similar issues, mm. or um, their issues are somewhat juxtaposed. Yeah. to throw the 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 issues at a heart in the novel into relief, I suppose, you know, so that we can kind of look at the potential for change in an individual and and that kind of thing. When I was writing the guilty one as well. I was very much aware of that. So I'm pretty much a character-driven writer. I sort of feel characters and see them. But um, when I was creating Sebastian's character, he was I uh, he was very much a construct for me. I definitely created him through reading about other children who have killed and sort of made a composite almost, you know, sort of created him in that sort of very uh, structural way. Whereas characters like Daniel and his foster mother, they were much more instinctual. They they came to me, um, you know, almost fully rounded. Well, yeah, I, I think the the fascinating thing that I guess I want to close on here is that, like, obviously the core through both the guilty and the innocent one is Daniel's relationship with Minnie. In many senses, what Minnie got to do was take Daniel away from that world of pain and hurt that he'd kind of landed in. But despite that, Daniel as an adult is still dealing with this whole idea of his misunderstanding in youth of the value that that had. I mean, 10 years down the line, revisiting this and re-exploring this concept, can Minnie ever get like the respect that she's deserved from Daniel? Or is it something that he'll be consigned to struggle with for his whole life, do you think? Yeah, I know I think I think that question you pose is 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 really pivotal. I mean that whole thing about, you know, the fact that maybe we don't value as much as we all should, you know, the 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 love and support that's that's helped to put us where we are. Um I think at the end of the the first novel, The Guilty One, um Daniel was was coming to a realization that many um, had saved him, ultimately. Um, but he he began the guilty one being very angry um, a, about her and was effectively estranged from her for many years. Quite a lot of the readers of the guilty one, they were very angry with Daniel for the way he had behaved. <laughs> um, and so I think even though he had reached that as a realisation himself at the end of the guilty one, in the innocent one, I think he really starts to understand it. And I think part of that is to do with the fact that he himself now is the parent. That he um, realizes that he's making mistakes. Perhaps that's where that real, true sense of forgiveness comes in. Possibly it makes the story more satisfying because there is that real vindication for, for many after all these years. Yeah, no, I think I think it's fantastic. I had a wonderful time with both of these books. And like, you know, as I said, it fits so lovingly into that like tradition of legal thrills of Tartan Noir, but tells such a powerful story of its own that I thought was like so clever structurally as well as emotionally. Um, so Lisa, thank you so much both for giving us these wonderful books and for sharing your time with us here on Death of the Reader. Oh, thank you so much for having me, Flix. It's just been a wonderful time. And thank you so much for getting up so early. No <laughs> All righty. Well, The Innocent Ones is out with Hachette in Australia. And we speak uh, with Lisa today. Thanks to Pegasus over in the United States, where it is out uh, this November. We'll have links up on the podcast, both of those. And thank you to those publishing houses for their work in getting this book out in the world. This is Death of the Reader, your murder mystery world tour here on 2SER 107.3. We'll be back in just a second. Thank you.
You're listening to Death of the Reader. Flex and Herds here for your Murder Mystery World Tour. And we are here discussing E.C. Bentley's Trent's last case. Herds is in the hot seat. I am the expert. And Herds, I've given you the solution to this book. Have you though? Or have, have I? You? You've given it to me twice now. You gave it to me last time we sat down to, the, to do this show. And you've given me chapter 11, which supposedly gives me the whole truth and nothing but the truth. I'm suspicious of one and or both of these these thoughts and feelings. Yeah, how could you do this to me? Although I do remember you saying something last week about me getting all the points no matter what. You know what, Herds? I'll have to go back and check the tapes <laughs> just to make sure that, you know, they weren't uh-huh. altered by your crack team okay. of scientists manipulating the game of in course, your favor. Of Please double check that for me. But I'm, no, I'm, I'm happy to give us a crack. <laughs> yeah, I suppose the interesting thing, as we mentioned, is that chapter 11 presents a letter that Philip Trent writes that describes his full breakdown, time, details, clues, suspects, alibis, and everything in between that he presents to Mrs. Manderson saying, this is yours, and if you're happy with me publishing it, let me know, but otherwise it is yours and yours alone to keep. And at the point that this chapter ends, we only have his signature at the end of the letter. We don't actually know what happens to it. Yeah, I think that's what's so cool about this letter, right, is that it's it's framed, like it's there in its entirety as though it has been published. It's like Mm. teasing you with damning Marlowe with everything that that the novel can muster. But it's down to the character of Our Lady and Black Mrs. Manderson uh, and and down to what what is the truth. Like why has he left the decision to her? Is it because he respects her? Is it because he has stuff he doesn't even know? He doesn't even know the truth of? Like I'm going to lean towards that one. I think that's much more fun. He he literally says in the previous chapter or, or maybe the chapter before that, that the only way he's going to get the truth is if he has, he, he takes a, a gamble. Well, what, what do you think he doesn't want Marlowe interred for? Because as the crime is presented, Marlowe committed this out of passion yes. after a dispute over his alleged affair with Mrs. Manderson. I, I think, I think, oh man, the affair is a funny one, isn't it? Which she seems to confirm in her, in a manner. She doesn't necessarily say, yes, I had say, an affair. She doesn't say it out loud. And suspiciously, the, the part of the letter, like the part of the crime that is left out from the letter is the actual murder. He goes, because the, the, the bulk of the letter is spent confirming that Marlowe created this ridiculous body alibi. Yeah. And I think that that is correct. But as you say, and and as I say, like the pieces that are missing here are like confirming the motivation, which is done with a syllable and nothing else. And also confirming what actually happened during the crime. Um, I think that the, uh, the, the thing that we're trying to confirm here is, is less about culpability and more about whether or not, Mrs. Manderson wants to convict Marlowe and then Trent will act based on what she wants the outcome of the case to be, basically. That's how I kind of see it. Well, yeah, but like if if the insinuation that they're having an affair is true, then that kind of ends here. But we still have another, you know, 45 percent of the novel to go. What do you think the details that Trent has missed or left out about the murder were? Let me let me preface this by saying that the breakdown of the crime thus far is basically that Marlowe went on this car ride to, quote, clear yes. Sigsby Manderson's head, shot him in the head, set up the scene in the garage, and then went on a drive to meet this George Harris, who doesn't really appear in the text other than by name, uh, to get away from the scene of the crime so that he could dispose of some of the other clues that he had uh, but there's some things like a handprint on a window that Trent thinks locks him into this case. Yep. And the insistence is, is that this was because Marlowe wanted to off Manderson so that he could marry Mabel. There are a couple of clues here that I'm kind of itching on. The main one is the scuff marks around, around the wrists or whatever, which is like a really specific place to mention that there are scuff, there is like scuff marks. Yeah. I think that the result of that is if you imagine Madison has a gun and he's probably going to shoot uh Marlo, let's say. Wait, what? Yes. Oh, so you're saying you're saying that this was a matter of self-defense that it wasn't a plan. I'm going to say this was an accident because 
the big question we've got here, and this is what we're going through, like the coroner's case and and all the back and forth is like, is it a suicide? Did someone kill him? All this nonsense. And in murder mysteries, when we're presented with two opposite conclusions, the answer is yes. I'm going to say that they went on this drive to clear their heads so that uh, Manderson could shoot Marlo. Uh, Manderson produces the gun and Marlo goes, that's not a good idea to have a gun. Gr- tries to like wrestle it out of his hands. That's where all like scratch marks on the wrists are coming from. Yep. And then a, a gunshot is fired and it goes through Manderson's skull. Oh, hold on. You're saying that this, this all happened in the car? Uh, you know what? That's a great question. The, the location is not, because- I'm not sure. I feel like, I mean, you know what a gunshot on the inside of a car looks like. If you're trying to press me to figure out the exact location where Madison no, no, got no, shot. Just, it's just that if you're suggesting it happened in the car, I feel like you'd need to explain away why there's no blood well, in the car. Clearly because they had an identical looking car just around the corner, conveniently. <laughs> I, I'm not sure. I, I would, yeah, I, I would say that he was killed in a location that the police have not looked at yet. A park somewhere, you know, somewhere where there are loud ringing bells to cover up the sound of the gunshot. This is the trick that I think that Trent is playing because the way that he describes the murder in the confession letter is that this was a complicated crime planned down to a T. Yep. I think that this is nonsense. Mm-hmm. I think that actually this is the most insane plan that anyone has ever come up with. Maybe he'd been like thinking about it, but I think that this was like a, like it, it was a spontaneous yeah. thing. I'm I'm curious though that you say that this is a trick that Trent is playing. Trent isn't publishing this letter unless he's yeah, given no, the blessing to it, because 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 it's it's not for the press. It's it's for Lady Manderson. It's to see what her reaction is. Right. Right. You think this is a trap to get her to fold yeah. under the pressure and give out more clues? Well, I, I think it's I think it's it's more so because he's saying I'm about to throw Marlo under the bus for a crime that he sort of didn't commit. Right. Right. What do you think about that? Do you want him to go away? Like, well, I, like, because if you she, think she wants him to go away, I don't think so. I mean, especially what if is he, their relationship? Oh, oh, <laughs> I hate having to pick this because he, here's, here's a bone I'll throw Please you. Please do throw me a bone proverbially and euphemistically because I could just say they're lovers, but like, I don't know that for sure. Well, because What's as I said, it seems like Trent is falling for Mrs. Yes. Manderson, so. Does Philip Trent get oh the goodness. girl, or is, you know, does this end up as a love triangle between Trent and Marlow as the killer and detective via not for the solution to the crime, but a I woman's mean, heart? I, I will say Trent would have a really hard time getting involved on a case if he if he was wed at the end of the book. I'm just like I'm just saying. So to summarize, Herds, if I've understood correctly, you think that everything in the letter is correct except that it was planned because it was an, an accidental, accidental killing. killing. Yes. After Manderson, Sigsby Manderson, tried to kill Marlo uh, over an affair that you think is happening. I want to say that he was planning suicide and then it turned into murder, accidental murder. Uh, okay, I, I, okay. I like that better. I think I think you've answered all of the questions that I have kind of hinged my main <laughs> points on here. Uh, the, the, I'll, I'll throw you this oh, no. one, though, Herds. I feel like you've kind of answered it, but just, just to kind of clarify it as a distinct moment here. Yeah, go for it. Why is this Trent's last case? I feel like I've talked about this a lot, but how do I put it into words? Oh, my goodness. My brain. I think it's emotionally, like, destructive. I think that he's, by the end of this case, going to see too much of, of human nature. And I think that he's going to be somewhat destroyed when he finds out that the lady in black never actually loved him. Let's go with that. That seems like a fun note there. If we like find out that all the affection, because that's what the second half of the novel could be, right? It's them like flirting and and getting it on. And then then one day she's like, actually, I never loved you. (laughs) Maybe maybe we don't go quite that far, but like, that's, that's what I want to go with. I think I'm happy with these answers. I mean, I hope you're happy. I, I'm happy. (laughs) Next week. Herds, (laughs) Herds, <laughs> we go all the way to the end of Trent's last case. I hope you are uh, as excited as I am to find out the true oh my goodness. cacophony. I'm excited to get, get to literally one point book. and just call it a day. <laughs> I'm ready. I'm ready for it. Well, didn't you say you were going oh, yeah, to get all the points, points to call it a day? Uh, um, I'm not nervous. Uh, um, anyway, <laughs> all the points. This is Death of the Reader, your murder mystery world tour. Next week, all the way to the end of Trent's last case. We'll be back with that. Stick around. You're on 2SER 107.3.